Hello everybody. Um, this is Ann Rice. It's September 18th, 2012. And I'm making this short video to answer the most frequently asked questions that I get by email and that also appear on my Facebook page. I thought I would make this and answer all those questions and I will post this frequently on the Facebook page. And also it can be found on my website via link and on my YouTube site. The most frequently asked question I get is, where can a person get a list of all my books in, in reading order or in publishing order? Well, there are three basic places. You can go to my website, annrice.com. You can go to the Wikipedia article on Anne Rice, which is pretty accurate right now. And you'll find an entire list there. And you can also go to my Facebook page. And in the introductory material, uh, there is a complete list of all my books. The reading order is really the publishing order. There is no other order but that one. And um, if you have the latest book that I've written, which is The Wolf Gift, you'll also find um, a complete list of all my books in publishing order inside that book in italics. Every published book that I've ever published has a complete list of all my other works in the front in italics, and it's always in publishing order. So those are the standard places where you can get that information. Um, any series that I ever wrote um, was meant to be read in publishing order, in the order in which I published it. And I have to confess that the Vampire Chronicles, of which there are 11 books, uh, were never intended to be an organized series. They were independent books written one after another about the same characters or characters related to those characters. So you're never going to find that to be a very coherent series. The Witching Hour books, of which I wrote basically three, The Witching Hour, uh, Lasher, and Taltos, were more of a continuous series, and they really make the best sense when they're read all together. But again, the real reading order is actually the writing order or the publishing order. Okay, the second book, the second question I get asked a lot, this is by people coming to my Facebook page, they ask, they say, I'm not seeing your post in my news feed. And, and how, what can I do about that? Well, if you go to like my page, which is all you have to do to join it, you'll see an arrow right by the like button. You press on that arrow, there's a drop down menu, and you'll see an option to press if you want to have all the posts appear in your news feed. You click on that and you'll get them all. If you don't do that, what Facebook does apparently is it sends different posts to different people based on what they've liked in the past. That's all I know about that. There are a lot of mysteries to do with Facebook, <laughs> but that, that's what I know right now about getting all the posts. Now, the, the question I'm asked, uh, the next question that I'm asked all the time is, what about movies of your works? Um, will we have any more movies with the Vampire Chronicles? Will we have any more movies with the Mayfair Witches? Will there be any uh, movie based on this vampire or that vampire? Well, let me explain. Um, first of all, I want movies to be made based on everything I've ever written. I have always wanted that. I have never been shy about it. I have very good agents, and we work on this all the time. If there haven't been movies made with a particular character or based on a particular book, it's not because of me. It's because we haven't been approached by people who want to make that particular movie and have the means to do it. But believe me, the phones are there. The agents are there. Everybody in the industry knows how to reach those agents, and we are always open for, for options, for suggestions. Now, at the present moment, uh, Imagine Entertainment, the Brian Grazier, Ron Howard company, has the option on the tale of the body thief, which is the fourth book in the Vampire Chronicles, and they are working on developing that. As long as one of the Vampire Chronicles is under option, nothing can happen with the others. Hollywood studios, producers, companies just won't buy one of a series and let you sell all the others to other competing companies. They tie up the series when they develop one book. And of course, what everybody hopes and dreams of is that the movie based on The Tale of the Body Thief will be a great success, and we will have offers to go on and make uh, every single book in the Vampire Chronicles into a film. And I would like nothing more than that. Believe me, I'm not the one holding up movies. It's a matter of, of, of getting bankable people, credible people, to come forward and to make offers to us that we can accept, and, and we then work with them to see that a movie is made. 
Another question I'm asked in conjunction with this is why I let them change my work when it's made into a movie. I don't really have the power to stop anybody from doing that, and really almost no author does. Even if you're strong enough and popular enough to get consultation rights in a movie contract, movie companies inevitably will go on and do to the movie what they want done. They'll consult with you, all right. They'll listen to you. You can plead for your character. You can plead for the ambiance. You can plead for the moral compass. You can plead for anything you want. But basically, they're going to make the movie that they want to make. And there really isn't a whole lot that any author can do to stop a production or to force them, say, to cast a particular person in a role or to make a change in the script that you find offensive. The, the strongest thing you can do is be friends with these people, talk to them, keep the communication lines open. But that isn't necessarily going to result in an outcome that's going to make you happy or your readers. Believe me, there have been times when I objected very, very much to things that were done in film. But I just didn't get anywhere with the people making the film. A very frequently asked question is why I let people make the Queen of the Damned film. Um, Again, the answer is I had no control over it. Warner Brothers owned the rights at that time. They had the right to make a movie based on the Queen of the Dam. I begged them not to do it. I begged them to make the Vampire Lestat. I told them that's what the readers wanted. Uh, they simply were not of the same mind. They didn't agree with me. They wrote, as many of you know, um, a script for the Queen of the Dam that was a, quite a departure from, from the character of Lestat and from the character of the Talamasca and the character of the other vampires, I begged them not to make it. They went on and they did what they wanted to do. So please understand, I'm not the one controlling these things. I'm not the one giving permission, really. People come, they sit down with us, they license the rights to develop a movie. It then becomes a very complex collaborative process in which many people compete with one another to, to control the final outcome, and the author has very little power in that situation. Nowadays, I think producers are much more sensitive to what the fans want and what the readers want. In the last 10 years, we've seen, that ha we've seen an, a number of examples where fans and readers have really exerted themselves to approve of a movie, particularly the comic book movies that are being made. Um, and I think producers now know that they really should pay some attention to the readers. And that's about the greatest power we all have to influence them, is to remind them that the many, many, many readers of a book that really want the movie to be faithful to it. And, and we're getting more influence in that regard. We're getting more than we had, say, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. But still, um, you know, to be fair to them, when people are going to spend 50 to 100 million dollars on something, they aren't going to let the author have sole control over it. They're, it's, the control is going to stay in the hands of the money people and the top execs involved in making the film. So I hope I've a answered that question. All right, another frequently asked question is, will I be coming to this or that area to sign books? And I really appreciate that question, and I'm very grateful that people want me to come to various cities to sign books. Actually, what happens with signings is this. Individual bookstores or libraries or literary festivals want to invite an author. They then contact the publisher in New York and present a proposal. Will you have the author come to our store, our library, our festival, etc.? And if the publisher approves of it and, and feels it's feasible and it would be a good thing, then they contact me and they say, would you like to go? I'm really willing to go almost anywhere. Uh, it's a matter of working it out with them. So I would love to come to all the different places that you guys mentioned on my Facebook page. I would love to, to be everywhere signing. And I have, over the years, been many, many places in this country signing books, and, and in England as well. Um, as a matter of fact, I'll be going to Paris, I think, in the spring to sign books and to see French readers, and I'm very excited about that. I think it's going to be a wonderful opportunity. But I wanted to explain how that works. Um, in the past, just the recent past, uh, I went to Brazil for a fabulous book festival there. It was just wonderful in Rio. And I also went to the Cheltenham Book Festival in England, and I enjoyed that very much. Again, I was invited to both by the powers that be, and um, they were wonderful experiences, wonderful trips. All right, another question I'm frequently asked is, how do you feel about Kindle and Nook? Um, how do I feel about ebooks, in other words? 
do I come down on the side of loving real books or do I come down on the side of, of, of e-books? Well, it, it's not a choice, really. I think that Kindle and Nook are opening up all kinds of opportunities for readers and for writers. They are part of a revolution in publishing that's bigger than all of us. And I don't think real books, beautiful hardcover books or beautiful paperback books, are ever going to go away. That's not going to happen. But we are seeing a revolution in publishing, and I think that trying to fight that revolution uh, is really a waste of time. You know, we, we have to accept that there are people with Kindle and Nook maybe who for some reason can't buy hardcover and paperback books, and they really want to read. And uh, that's great. I'm all for it. I'm for the book in any form. And I'm hoping that this big revolution in publishing will work itself out in the next few years. It, it seems like publishing right now is in crisis. Bookstores are closing. Chain bookstores are going out of business. Um, Amazon.com remains very healthy and very strong. And I think, really, um, in spite of the criticism it gets, Amazon has done more for writers like me and readers like me than any other single entity. But there's a big shakeup going on, and we don't know exactly what's going to happen. We're seeing things like the Espresso Book Machine, which can produce a, a book on demand. You, you can go into a, a, a library or, or a store where they have the Espresso Book Machine, and you can say, I, I want a printed copy of a book from 1850. There's a digital file of that book that you can access. Will you print out the book for me? And they can do that within something like 20 minutes on the espresso coffee machine. They can print you out a paper book with cardboard covers. And it's bound, and, and you'll get it and have it in your hand. Well, that, that is a wonderful thing for those of us who love to read old and out-of-print books and books in the public domain that you can't find anymore in a bookstore. And that is a way that, that self-published writers can see their work in hard covers. And things like that are going to change the whole business. You know, we, we may get to a point where bookstores are really small cafes with only uh, sample copies of books on display for you to feel and hold and marvel at. And then you go over to the machine and you tell them what you want and they print out a copy for you and you take that home. All of this stuff is happening and, and it, it's, just, it's just wonderful. It's very exciting. It's sad if you think about what's being lost, but we have to think about what's being gained. Um, we have to think about opportunity and increased readership and increased opportunities for people who couldn't ever break into conventional publishing, people who, um, who really self-publish. And, th and there can be a lot of very talented people self-publishing. Never think that the best writers are published by New York publishers and inferior writers are self-published. That's, that's not the way it is at all. New York publishing has often missed really talented people again and again and again. And often, really genius people, really revolutionary people, really uh, eccentric people are rejected by New York publishers because they don't not effectively financially publish them. But self-publishing can be a boon to those people. And just every few months, it seems, we hear of a self-published writer who was very successful now being picked up by a New York publisher. So the bottom line is, um, I think this is really a great time. Um, the digital revolution is part of it. Kindle, Nook, all of that. Well, that's all the questions I can think of right now, and uh, I hope this has, you know, answered some question that maybe you have. And please join us on the Facebook page for our many discussions. We'd love to have you.